Let's pray. Lord, uh, the beginning of some people's lives may not be on the solid rock, but you still have the ability, Lord, to give them a solid foundation to build on no matter what the start of their life was, where they came from, their family system, or maybe even mistakes they've made. Tonight, we're thankful for that, Lord, that you're regenerating grace, you're remaking of our hearts, our lives, our minds. This is a miracle, bringing us from a point of being dead in trespasses and sin to new life. Bless us tonight, Lord, as we think about how to build on that solid rock and let you start taking up the superstructure of a new life to your name's honor and glory. So guide us now, touch us all with your spirit, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we've been on a journey, and what I want you to be able to do as we go through this journey is discern the difference between um, the wheat and the chaff. We are to build on the words of Christ, the principles of Scripture. We also have the blessing and benefit of the spirit of prophecy. If we can bring those slides up, I want to do a little bit of rehearsing of last night's message. Uh, Ellen White writes, there are many in the church who at heart belong to the world, but God calls upon those who claim to believe the advanced truth to rise above the present attitude of the popular churches of today. Where is the self-denial, where is the cross-bearing that Christ has said should characterize his followers? I want you to remember that Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what I remind people is you can have peace on the outside and no rest on the inside. Or you can have peace on the inside and you're going to have some challenges on the outside. If you choose the outside method, the problem is, as Solomon said, remember the Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come in which you take no delight in Him. You'll be forced to deal with trauma in both places. But if we choose to trust Jesus and let our burden be light because we bear the cross with Him, we will be different. We will not be popular. Our church may not even be popular but we will have a representation of Christ in our midst. The reason, she writes, we've had so little influence upon unbelieving relatives and associates is that we have manifested little decided difference in our practices from those of the world. Now, do you think the devil knew this when he came along and started speaking in the ear of a, a, a small man who had been a missionary in India and didn't really think that those mission stations had succeeded. I'm talking now about Donald A. McGavern, the founding father of the church growth movement. He wasn't too terribly impressed with all the sacrifice. And in his mind, it had to have a large uh, people movement, a large number. The devil's very understanding of how spiritual laws work and spiritual power for church. Um, in this case, she addresses parents. Parents need to awake and purify their souls by practicing the truth in their home. Remember, it's love that works by faith, purifying the soul. I just want to remind you, as a safeguard against evil, preoccupation of the mind with good is worth more than unnumbered barriers of law and discipline. That's, that's from the book Education, page 213. Love for Jesus is the instrumentality of transitioning, transforming, and bringing new life to us. So this purity that comes to our soul comes by acting out in love for Jesus, in faith that he will strengthen us to do it, in faith that he will forgive us when we have not represented rightly. And there's beauty in this. When we reach the standard that the Lord would have us reach, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, straight-laced extremists. And then she ends the quote writing to the students at Battle Creek. I want you to know this was written to young people. Our young people are quite capable of managing the truth as long as they're letting the Spirit lead in their lives. Sometimes we think we have to protect them. That's the last thing we'd want to do is shield them from the power of the Holy Spirit to allow them to lay a deep foundation. So odd singular, straight-laced extremists. I think this will become very true in the future. The gospel is going to break out again. The usefulness of a minister of Christ is measured by the results of his labors. When men and women receive the truth and their lives adorn it, in other words, fruits worthy of repentance, following the example of their Lord in submission and surrender and service, of course, I'm fleshing that out, they recommend the truth and the minister who presented it. The minister is greatly strengthened by these seals of his ministry. 
Uh, this is the reference I was referencing to last night. Just like any other workman, a godly parent, a faithful elder, a steadfast pastor, when he does or she does her work well, leaves a mark on the people through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's nothing that'll ruin a church faster than baptizing the world and not allowing the person to come to the cross and be remade. If you baptize enough of these people, you can create a whole dysfunctional family where there's a lot of that quarreling. And we remember last night, James telling us where there's quarreling and strife and division, it's because you're worldly. And Paul's not afraid to tell the Corinthian church, you're, you're not converted. And of course, we would probably be tempted to think of that as a very judgmental statement. But there are fruits of conversion and there are evidences of transformed lives. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy are quite clear on this. Paul regarded the Corinthian brethren as his testimonial. He loved them, for they were the fruit of his labor. The reformation wrought in them was sufficient evidence of his authority to counsel, reprove, and exhort. And tonight I want to talk with you about authority and to command as a minister of Christ. Ye are our epistles, he says, written in our hearts and known and read of men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered to us, written not with ink, but the spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. She goes on to write that our churches are becoming enfeebled. So every pastor and elder should be listening. Every parent should be listening. They're becoming enfeebled by receiving for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, you can compile all the data you want. You can survey all you want. You can come together. And by the way, in this day and age and tonight, I'm going to be making a very important point that when you have a contradiction between gathered data and inspiration, you shouldn't hesitate to know which way you go in making your decision. Now, we could do a lot of surveys about why people left the church, and some of them have been done, but we could stop and say to ourselves, the real element of Christianity, the real spirit in God's people will work. It will produce fruit. It will produce healthiness. But our churches are becoming enfeebled because we're receiving Doc, for doctrines, the commandments of men. Many are received into the church who are not converted. Yes, somebody's supposed to do some checking. Yes, you're supposed to do just a little bit of pressing. Yes, there's supposed to be an examination of the candidate. Yes, it used to be very difficult to become a Methodist. You had to go for a long period of time and you had to satisfy the experience of the leaders of the church in applying the principles of the Bible to your life. But I want to assure you that church grew and became a powerhouse. It used to be the largest Protestant church in the world. And now it's imploding and dividing as the conservative churches in Africa and the liberal Western churches divide over the inspiration of Scripture. And if plain printed black ink on white paper means what it says in its most natural reading of the word. Men and women who are allowed to take part in the solemn rite of baptism without being fully instructed in regards to the meaning of this ordinance. This is a big problem. There's need of more thorough preparation on the part of candidates for baptism. I hope that all my fellow pastors that listen to this message realize that this was written 100 years ago. And if there was a more thorough need then, there's probably a much more thorough need now because we're steeped, you know, we are incubated, as it were, in a culture of secularism, and we are the frog in the kettle, and we bring some of those things to our Christian experience. They're in need of more faithful instruction than has usually been given. The principles of the Christian life should be made plain to those who have newly come to the truth. Now, the fruits worthy of repentance and the discipleship that gets us onto the rock and, and makes us ready to withstand the storms of life because there is an enemy, that journey shouldn't be rushed. Nobody should be hurried into a baptistry. We do not believe that you get your salvation on the day you're baptized. We believe beyond the shadow of a doubt when you receive Christ, you've received eternal life. We also believe that Jesus himself said that we should, through the apostles, study to show ourselves approved and that we should count the cost. And we know that John rebuffed the Pharisees when they came. And we understand that it takes time to make an understanding of a commitment that's to last all through your life and all through eternity. Now, the early church had a few advantages, and I want to tell you what they were. In the early church, you could be thrown in jail, you could be exiled, or you could be killed. 
And that kind of sifted out all the people that weren't sincere about loving Jesus and wanting to be a part of the way. We don't have that anymore. So consequentially, some people feel offended if a pastor or an elder suggests that we're going to take a little bit more time. We want you to study this. But baptism is not a right in the sense of R-I-G-H-T. It is a right in the sense of R-I-T-E. Baptism is a stewardship of protection for the individual who is supposed to be launched into a lifelong vibrant relationship with Christ. But if you put a fatal flaw in the software of their understanding about how Christianity works and they never discover there's a cross and there's things to give up and there's things to change and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ through his power, you've done them a great, great disservice. Yes, the principles of the Christian life should be made plain to those who have newly come to the truth. When they give evidence that they fully understand their position, they're to be accepted. But when they show that they're following the customs and fashions and sentiments of the world, they are to be faithfully dealt with. Now, it used to be inside of Adventism that we had a pretty common understanding of where the family definitions were, at least from things that you could visibly see or talk about. It would be issues of belief in our doctrine, and it would be issues of lifestyle. And we believed that there were certain family identity dynamics that we embraced that showed a measure of this peculiarity and this distinctness. We've come into an age where we've tried to make obedience. I don't think most listening to me have, but the enemies of the gospel have tried to make obedience the equivalent of legalism. Remember, legalism is a disease of the mind and the motivations. Obedience is not legalism. Obedience, when the indwelling Christ is in your heart, is an expression of love to God. Remember said, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And John would write, they're not grievous. So for us, what we need to remember is, is that those lifestyle dynamics protect us from the world, from corrupting our relationship. Because if you engage the world, just like Paul mentioned about Demas when he wrote, Demas loved the world, and thus he left Paul. He lost his way. Falling back in love with the world, since Jesus said you can't serve two masters, is the journey to leaving Jesus, whether it starts and takes a long time or whether it's pretty quick. Participation in this ordinance means much, and our ministers should be careful to give each candidate for baptism plain instruction regarding its meaning and its solemnity. In this church, it doesn't matter who studies with the candidate. Before they're baptized, they sit down with me. And my journey with them is mainly an opportunity to encourage them in a personal relationship, but I go back over a lot of things, very simply, very succinctly. It's primarily an opportunity to encourage them in a strong life for Jesus. But we're not going to take a shortcut to the baptistry because a shortcut to the baptistry might be a detour from eternity. All high or low, if they're unconverted, are on one common platform. Men may turn from one doctrine to another, this being done and will be done. Papists may change from Catholicism to Protestantism, yet they may know nothing of the meaning of the words, a new heart also I will give you. This is a real potential temptation to Protestants, to Seventh-day Adventists. But just because somebody's going to church doesn't mean they've embraced the cross. Doesn't mean that they are shoulder to shoulder in the harness and the yoke with Jesus. It's important that we take the time to make sure they understand. Accepting new theories and uniting with the church do not bring new life to anyone, even though the church with which they unite may be established on the true foundation. Follow this next sentence. It's going to be in the next slide. Connection with the church does not take the place of conversion. Now, if there's anybody listening to me who's been a real student of the church growth movement in any of its forms and varieties, and I wouldn't want anybody that's a Seventh-day Adventist pastor to think that it has not found its way in in many places. I want to tell you, worship and music is probably one of the most preeminent places. We ought to do some serious looking to make sure that we're not tainted by the dynamics of the world. But to subscribe to the name of a church creed is not of the least value to anyone if the heart isn't truly changed. This is why Paul would say, I die daily. Connection with the church, she says, does not take the place of conversion. If they feel no burden to change their course of action, they should not be accepted as members of the church. Is everybody listening to me here tonight okay with that? Do you understand that a pastor who does the baptizing is going to be responsible for that person's lack of eternal salvation if he takes a shortcut to the baptistry 
and doesn't give the person a chance to actually look deep inside their life. Pray the prayer of Psalm 139, Lord, search me and know me and see if there be any wicked way in me. There should be a beauty and a fruitfulness. Those fruits are des described in the book of Galatians chapter 5. There should be a willingness to bear the cross. There should be a joy and a soberness. There should be a willingness to be taught and to accept the instruction that comes from those that God's ordained to be stewards of the go growth of the church. The Lord wants those who compose his church to be true, faithful stewards of the grace of Christ. And I want to assure you, I've got some practice with these things. I hate to tell you some of my unpleasant stories, but there have been moments when I've had to talk with people about things that they were studied with by somebody else, and I had to have a discussion with them. And I want to assure you, uh, in some of those moments, it's like a volcano going off. Well, I want to tell you that most of man's wrath is not holy. And when you have that kind of engagement with somebody, it's the evidence that they're not ready. On the other hand, when we in humility of soul can be taught by those that are, they are freighted with a stewardship of discipleship, when you can be taught and you can listen, there's probably a pretty good chance that you're right on the mark and getting ready. Processes are losing the mark of distinction that distinguishes them from the world. And they're lessening the distance between themselves and the Roman power. They've turned away their ears from hearing the truth. Now, I, I think tonight it's important for us to stop and recognize this. In the old 1959 uh, black and white movie of Martin Luther, which is one I highly commend, one of my favorite two uh, films, there's a place in that moment when he's early in his life and he has not yet taken a stand against indulgences. But Tetzel has been banished from being there in Wittenberg, but he's across the river selling his indulgences. And people make the trek, even though it wasn't an age of modern conveyance and automobiles, etc. And one of the key moments in Luther's life is when after those indulgences are sold, and I do appreciate the way the videographer does the video, there's one of Luther's parishioners drunk at the bottom of stairs. And uh, he's uh, confronted by the pastor, Pastor Luther. And uh, Luther doesn't yet quite understand righteousness by faith, and saved through grace. But he tells his parishioner, yeah, we'll hear about this in the confessional. And he says, I ain't need no confessional, as he slurs his words. Then he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out an indulgence. Luther reaches down, snatches it out of hand and looks at it, wads it and wrinkles it up, throws it on the ground. He says, if I don't put a hole in Tetzel's drum. You see, how the Romanist church works is it allows you to embrace the world and supposedly the church at the same time. The church growth movement has done for Protestantism what Romanism has done through the millennia. And this is why Protestantism is dead. Because Protestantism has found a way in the name of success to destroy the church. The church growth movement is the Trojan horse to bring down the Protestant church. You cannot baptize the world. Light and darkness don't go together. But somehow the Protestant world, in the name of succeeding and growing these Megan churches, has excise the cross out of the experience of the gospel. They've been unwilling to accept the light which God shed upon their pathway, and they're therefore going into darkness. They speak with contempt of the idea that there will be a revival of the past cruel persecution on the part of the Romanists and those who affiliate with them. A lot of people don't believe that we're going to see the beast with blood on its claws again, but we are. They don't recognize the fact that the word of God fully predicts such a revival. And it will not concede that the people of God in the last days shall suffer persecution. Although the Bible says the dragon was wroth with the woman and made, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now pay attention here because I'm going to talk about the shaking. And the, the influence of our culture and the what I call church growth consumer model of church has thoroughly infected. There's not a one of us here today who hasn't been tainted by it. And in some places, whole churches have gone this way. We used to have Milwaukee, Oregon. We used to have Grace Place, Colorado. We used to have all the celebration phenomena that was going on the, on the West and the East Coast. These are all different permutations, all different iterations of the consumer-based approach to church, not the inspiration-driven version. Now, I'm kind of a curious person. And of course, Grace Place in Colorado 
totally flipped over and is no longer even a Seventh-day Adventist church. And it just so happened to be that the pastor that pastors it, son of one of our conference administrators in this division, just about my age, not in seminary exactly the same time I was. He's just a little bit older than me. And I've, I've driven around and gone right by the church and sat in the parking lot and looked around. And it's a sad testament of what a consumer-based approach to religion can do because it does work. But eventually, if you continue approaching the gospel with the spirit of the world, you'll end up flipping over doctrines like the Sabbath and calling them legalistic and your new supposed joy in being liberated from the law of God. Standard after standard, she writes, was left to trail. Actually, I don't think I read that one. I saw two armies in terrible conflict. One army was led by banners bearing the world's insignia. The other was led by the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. Now, this is sad. She's writing to Seventh-day Adventists. This is out of the Eighth Testimony. And she says, standard after standard was left to trail in the dust. In other words, well, we'll let the sentence say what it needs to. Company after company from the Lord's army joined the foe. So I want you to visualize it. You know, like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the church is trod. We are not divided. All one army, we, one in faith and doctrine, one in charity. Well, maybe not quite so much. You extract the cross from Adventism, and pretty soon you'll have a lot of divisions. And you won't be one army, and you won't be united. I want you to see them dropping the standard, which is a flag, dropping it in the dust, and going over to the other side. But praise God for the good news. He has other sheep not of this fold. And I want you to see people who have been longing and looking for deliverance. And they see God's army mighty and terrible with banners. And they run to that place. And they pick up the standards. And they fall into the ranks with God's people, and we're going to see some of the most amazing movement. It's going to break our heart. We've been told that some lights that are very bright, I'm guessing she's talking about administrators and preachers, teachers, professors. We're going to see some lights go out. Why? Because they've been walking away from the cross for a long time. And the mark of the beast isn't so primarily about the Sabbath, although the Sabbath is what divides it's primarily about our love for the Savior and our submission and our ability and willingness to bear the cross, the shame, the ignominy, the suffering. Tribe after tribe from the ranks of the enemy, united with the commandment people, keeping people of God. Praise God and hallelujah. An angel flying in the midst of heaven put the standard of Emmanuel into many hands. Think about it, these angels flying in heaven while a mighty general cried out with a loud voice, come into line. Let those who are loyal to the commandments of God and the testimony of Christ now take their position. You know what the Bible says, when the enemy comes in like the flood, the Lord himself will raise up a standard. We don't have to be afraid of the future, but we better build on the rock. We better sharpen our swords on the word of God. And we better be prepared in these little skirmishes that we have nowadays to get used to the disfavor of men and women. Come out from among them, the Bible says. Be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. We read this from Corinthians chapter 6, second book. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters. Let all who will come up to the help of the Lord to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Meteoric rise, a transition now of customer-driven religion in recent decades explains why churches are increasingly looking, sounding, and acting like American corporations. They've adapted their forms and their systems to be maximally efficient and responsive to shifts in the marketplace. Now, I want to tell you something. For all the godly, dedicated businessmen we have, businesswomen we have, praise the Lord. And may their skill in dealing with different dynamics of ordering people and finances, may they bring the very best they can into the church. But they need to remember this. The church is a family, not a business. And we're going to do business as a family business. And we need all the proper safeties and protocols and redundancies so that we don't experience anything that's immoral, anything that's disorderly. But the problem with the consumer-driven church 
is that we pretty much took the business template and we laid it right over the church and we allowed it to reconfigure in the name of success. Let's see here. You want to advance that one for me? Thank you. Perhaps it was bound to happen eventually in a consumer-driven marketplace, but American society will be paying the spiritual cost for this shift for years to come. The church growth consumer model has undermined the biblical doctrine of authority and leadership. And in the little bit of time I have left here tonight, I want you to understand, when you reconfigured, when in any way you embrace the principles of the world and the dynamic of mutually beneficial self-exchanges, exchanges with others, when you took out a marketing paradigm to do church, when in the name of success you abandoned the cross and the authority of the word, it was the demise of the family, it was the demise of marriage, it was the demise of society, and it is the demise of the church. In this new environment, churchgoer could and did leave congregations sometimes serially, which means in large numbers, for any number of reasons, among them uninspired preaching, conflict with fellow parishioners, or a desire to protest new policies and practices. This is what the consumer Christian does. Mainline Christians, churches also indulge their clientele by revamping the practice of ministerial counseling. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. The program that I'm in for my postgraduate studies is a leadership program. And you need to know that the new leadership template or paradigm is no longer the concept that we believe in Seventh-day Adventists about a moral man or a moral woman sensing from God a moral direction to go. It's all now about adapting to whatever direction the individual wants to go and helping them get there. The modified version of pastoral counseling would involve principles appropriated from psychotherapy, such as mirroring, letting parishioners find their own answers instead of offering directive advice. And of course, everyone does have to find their way, but there are indeed laws that govern and guide. In effect, God's representatives now presented themselves not as authorities, but instead as companions for the journey, wherever it may lead. Sounds kind of new agey, doesn't it? Companions for the journey, wherever it may go. Churchgoers learn to wield influence by voting or threatening to vote with their feet. They were, in effect, training organizations and church leaders to cater to their professed needs, even if their demands for new gym equipment or yoga classes weren't exactly essential to saving souls. You know, you, you have a dangerous, you have a very dangerous dynamic in this community because it's a shopper's community, and any Mecca or ghetto, or whatever you want to call it, wherever there's a large Seventh-day Adventist institution, you've got the potential to say, well, that's not my flavor. I'm going to leave this behind. It's very important that we have a sense about how God's directing in our lives and what it takes to have a healthy family. Woe to the congregation that wouldn't take its marching orders from feedback cards dropped in the offering plate. I tell you, a consumer Christian is a very difficult thing for a pastor to deal with, especially a rich one, especially an influential one. It makes, it makes our job very unpleasant. But I'll tell you what, a dedicated, consecrated Christian with good education, maybe good networking, maybe even with a large amount of resources, they can do so much good. But they need to remember, this is the family of God, and somebody was ordained to give it some leadership. It's done with a group. People can run roughshod over a church. So in this church, we believe in a system that, that works through the spirit in groups. But we still have to recognize that God does ordain. Customers in the new religious marketplace seem to have little awareness of what's been lost in the course of this transformation. Age-old ideas about what constitutes a new heart, they've been abandoned. They're gone. The relationship between clergy and laity has been reversed. Increasingly, congregants in the pews get to dictate which aspects of religious faith they will abide and which they will ignore. And that's not good. Because if we want to lay the family model over the church, it would be as unhealthy for the church as it would be for a teenager to get liberated. And by the way, this is what our society's done. I mean, one of my favorite cartoons that I have in a stack of papers that I keep is somebody outside a movie theater. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of these people with a big face and a long nose, and they're leaning out of the booth for the movie theater. And they're looking down at somebody that's underage. And they're, they, they're saying to the kid, no, I can't let you in here. What do you think this is, an abortion clinic? I want you to think about what we've done. When your kids go off to college, even though you're paying the bill, you can't look at their grades unless they give you permission. 
We've done all kinds of things in this society to make sure kids can do what they actually still need some oversight in doing. And we've separated oversight especially from those that have had the responsibility of nurturing and discipling and sometimes correcting. It's not good. And then what do we do? We blame the teachers and the policemen. It doesn't work good. The vacuum of authority has allowed parishioners to enjoy the spiritual equivalent of spending all day on the couch, eating cupcakes for dinner, and watching sitcoms until the wee hours. Spiritually, I don't think that could work very good. And the next slide gets a little more detailed. A church without genuine spiritual discipline is as effective at elevating souls as a donut diet is for slimming waistlines. You actually need somebody that stands in this pulpit that will both encourage you, which is what we call encouragement, and exhort you, which is reminding you to do what's right, and instructs you in all righteousness, and sometimes rebukes and reproves, and sometimes it's one-on-one. This is what a pastor is called to do, or an elder, or a dad, or a mom, all in varying degrees of responsibility, or a teacher. This is what has to happen. Unless we openly address the competitive nature of the new religious marketplace and educate our parishioners about what they should be demanding of their church experiences, we can expect religious consumers to keep demanding the cost-free approach to discipleship that has come to mark and mar our generation. Now, this is where I definitely disagree with Gordon, uh, with G. Jeffrey McDonald. He believes that the only real way to recover is for the church itself to wake up and change the leaders. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Leadership works when God's Spirit moves on an individual, and that individual then, in the name of God, either finds others that will move with them or announces and others decide to move with them. He believes that the market-driven approach can be reversed and put in a different direction to fix what's wrong. I don't believe that for a second. As a matter of fact, what I believe is we've actually been breaking down the actual civic and religious and interpersonal character backbone of our society, and we can't stand up for anything anymore. We can watch as civic liberties are stripped away and force and coercion are used, and people that have served well, we go back to the last three years of this pandemic, we had nurses and doctors and therapists that served without any kind of mitigation for their own infection. And then later on, after they had already been infected and had natural immunity, they said, we don't want to take a shot. And many stood by in society and in the organizations that had lauded them as heroes and showed them the door. Lots of people should have stood up and said, that wasn't right. But because we don't have the strength that comes, some don't, with the living God in their heart, we were willing to watch all of these things be stripped away from people who had made sacrifices. Perhaps now this very landscape needs a bit more diversity as churches compete to extend grace at an ever cheaper price. True spiritual discipline has become a rarity, and the many purveyors seem convinced that the market for it has dried up. He's a little bit more hopeful, but they may be wrong. Americans may be hungrier than anyone has recognized in recent years for the kinds of challenges that turn their ancestors into spiritual giants. Tonight, I choose to believe that there is a world that is looking, wistfully looking, Ellen White writes. And as they look to the heavens, they're hoping that somebody will explain some of these things to them. This is important. I'm going to end on this slide tonight and pick up tomorrow. You never, never, never survey anything that's an issue of morality or moral authority. If you can't stand... If you can't be the person that Ellen White describes, I spent five Sabbaths talking about it. I'm going to leave you with this quote tonight. We cannot follow the consumerist approach to religion, not with our young, because we don't understand them and they need some kind of special path that brings the world in, because the world's already in there, not with our middle-aged, not with our seniors. So I leave you with this thought. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. People, people who will not be bought or sold, people who in their inmost souls are true and honest, people who do not fear to call sin by its right name, people whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, people who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. You see, lots of that has been abandoned in the name of the consumerist church growth model. And what was so deceptive about it is that these churches not only grew and blossomed, but their programming was so professional and their videos so inspiring. 
and their talk of grace so encouraging. The problem was that there's more than one kind of grace, and we're not supposed to recycle over and over again on the dynamic. I mean, we do need forgiveness every day, but we're actually supposed to teach a living relationship that gives an empowering grace that actually allows some of those things to be in the rearview mirror, and eventually all of them. But if nobody will stand up, if there is no moral authority, if there's nobody to say, you can't run a family that way, and since this is God's family, it can't be run that way either. If there's never any moral authority, if the Word of God itself doesn't have authority and the people who handle the Word don't know it has authority, and a lot of these books are rich on philosophy and method, and they're very poor and empty on biblical direction. Tonight I'm here to tell you that God has announced that there will be an expression of moral authority before probation closes. That's going to be the three angels' messages. They're going to be given with a loud voice, and the message is going to be fear God. And when you know what it says, the real issue of the end is going to be about who do you obey and who do you worship. And that worship is exactly what the devil set his target on because he knows if you lower the threshold and you bring in the world, whatever you behold and whatever you do, it's what you become. Tonight, I want to assure the opposite is true as well. As we behold Jesus, as we see the authority that is in his word, as we actually pra practice structures that create accountability and balance because, as we know, uh, power can breed corruption. But in our Seventh-day Adventist system, we're going to have to come back to the fact that there's authority in the home. There's authority in the school. There's authority in the church. There are structures that actually protect civilized behavior and Christian, in a Christian environment in a family community. You can survey what color the carpet is and how much they like the lunch, but you can't survey the preaching of the word. And I want to assure you something. If there's one thing that, that I don't want ever to happen <laughs> when I'm done preaching, you know, in some places when they're done preaching, everybody applauds. We really don't need to be applauding when people are done singing or playing their instruments either. It's an offering to God. It's not a public performance, although they are exercising their gifts. But we have a whole completely different value system. But without being informed of it, our ignorance can lead us to look just like the world. It's not good for anybody. Sometimes in this pulpit or in a Sabbath school class or in a private visit, things have to be said. The Bible says the wounds of a friend can be trusted, but an enemy gives out kisses. I'm afraid that the Protestant church decided that the world approved of a, an embrace and a hug and a kiss. But when the premise isn't built on the Jesus that we looked at the other night, who actually stood up to a lot of people, including his closest friends, and died alone, we're on the wrong track. So tonight I'm appealing to you. Understand the authority is in the Word. And that authority has the ability to change our lives, change our practice, Give us courage to go through the hard times. May God help us as we make a distinct choice to turn away from a consumer model of running our homes, running our schools, and running our churches. We're mission-driven. We should be divinely directed, Holy Spirit administrated through groups of people. And there is still moral authority. And when people exercise it as clumsy and hard as it is, it leads to health and well-being and fruitfulness. May God help us as we accept the authority of the word and abandon the principles of the consumer mindset, especially in the circle of our home and the circle of our church. Let's stand together for our closing hymn. Page 185.
Lord, in the Old Testament, you rebuked your people for going to Egypt. Our journey, Lord, is not exactly the same. But forgive us, Lord, when we have supplanted divine inspiration and the willingness of the Spirit to direct our steps for a wrong dependence and a wrong use of gathered information in the form of data. And while data, Lord, is something that is important, May we understand that it must be sieved, especially through moral dynamics, through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy under the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And may we not go looking, Lord, for various opinions about things there's already an authoritative word on. Forgive us when we've done it, Lord. Forgive us when we put our mission out for debate, as it were, amongst those who are only nominally committed or are relating to us as consumers. Lord, you've said that you'll make yourself responsible for the success of the work. You've told us not to turn to the right or the left, that nobody would be able to stand against us and we would prosper in everything we do. I'm praying, Lord, help us to come back to the place where we start with you and interpret the data through the dynamics of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, knowing what to keep and what to jettison. Certainly, Lord, we've lived long enough in this experiment with the social sciences and even other sciences to know what looked like is right now is proved wrong later. But that's not how your word works. So I'm praying, Lord, restore proper authority to every home. May it be in a godly sort. May we be submitted to each other and servants of each other. And yet, may those who lead, lead as an act of service to create structure, stability, guardrails for those whose lives might be, be being lived a bit more recklessly. And now, Lord, I'm praying a prayer of gratitude for how you've blessed this congregation as we sought to build on the rock. Bless us now as we continue this journey. Bring us back tomorrow night, I pray. And thank you for this place to gather and to hear the words of inspiration. May we walk in them, walking in the light. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>